nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So now we're getting more sophisticated. We'll do a single barrier. A, so we look at open systems transmission through a single barrier. Um, again, the approach is sort of alongside a systems or wave matching approach, a scattering matrix approach, where the idea is that uh, you have an incident wave and a reflected wave, a transmitted wave and an incident wave. And that in between you have auxiliary waves, auxiliary variables that are connecting one system to the next. And there's no particles lost in this approach, right? It's a scattering matrix approach, uh, which is kind of makes this whole thing easier. And you typically assume again that there's only a wave coming from the left and nothing coming from the right, right? That's the typical approach when you calculate this. And you can do this with two scattering matrices. And um, you consider the case where an electron is coming in at an energy uh, uh, below the barrier height. And you start again from an ansatz that where on, on the left you have a, a forward propagating and a reverse propagating state. Inside the barrier you have two decaying waves, one decaying to the left, one de decaying to the right. That means there's a a wave that is actually exponentially increasing. And you have again in the ansatz a wave propagating on the left and the right at a certain phase velocity um, on the right region beyond the barrier. And you have propagating constants k and a, a, in the decay constant gamma. You can step through all this math. The key element to take away is that you match at each interface, on at zero and at L, you match the wave function and you match its derivative on the left and the right of that interface. Right? The math is just algebra at this stage. Uh, you can manage this in matrix form where you can say, I have my uh, waves on the left uh, are functions as terms of a matrix of uh, a, a transfer matrix of the, my auxiliary variables C and D, and C and D are also functions of a matrix in a matrix of my input variables on the right, E and F. So that gets you closer to a concept that you can say, well, I'm basically computing as my function of input E and F on the right, I have an A and B as a, a big transfer matrix M, and that a transmission coefficient is is the square ratio of E over A of the transmitted over the incident wave, which is 1 over this matrix element M11 squared. So there's two cases to look at. If the energy is less than the barrier, you can calculate an analytic expression uh, that has a hyperbolic uh, 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 sign in it. You can look at an expression that's slightly different for energies above the barrier. And in interestingly enough, this has a sign component to it. And you already see that in this sign component, uh, that means that transmission over the barrier is not smooth. Okay? It is energy dependent. And it's energy dependent or as a function of K2L. What's K2L? K2 is the propagation constant above the barrier, and L is the length of that barrier. Okay, so the length of the barrier suddenly matters for the transmission over the barrier. Let me say that again. The transmission over the barrier depends on the length of that barrier, even though the wave has enough energy to go over the barrier. And it's in the form of a sine square. As it said in the earlier lecture, that looks like a bound state. Okay? It's a discrete state with sine. 
right? A sine function without the exponential part is a bound state. And you catch a k2 times l in this expression. Okay? Later I will use the term, there's a quasi-bound state sitting above the barrier. And you can also do typical approximations that you see in textbooks being done. I don't think those are so important. The key element is to realize that there is a modulation of the transmission coefficient above the barrier, and there is an exponential dependence below the barrier. Okay? All right, so now let's look at a single barrier. And again, this is, you can duplicate this with a PCPBT tool on NanoHub, where, uh, so here's a barrier, pretty thin, 10 nanometers, and plotted here is the transmission coefficient um, through this barrier. So note number one, electrons can tunnel. Okay, any classical particle would reflect. Okay, so electrons can tunnel through barriers. Waves can tunnel through barriers. By the way, the reason I can see through my glass, an electromagnetic wave can tunnel through this uh, glass, all right? So tunneling is not all that bizarre. It's just we don't think of it that way in classical particles. But we know waves can tunnel, right? So that's number one. And then note again that above the barrier, right, where transmission should be perfect in terms of classical thinking, it is not perfect, meaning perfectly one. It's modulated above the barrier. And in fact, you can argue that there is a quasi-bound state that, that sits above that barrier. And if you actually plot the reflection coefficient, which is 1 minus t, you actually see a, a strong dip in there. That means Right at resonance, at that quasi-bound state, the transmission is 1. Reflection goes to 0. Okay? It's strongly modulated. All right, now let's make this barrier thicker. What you find is that, well, a thicker barrier uh, prevents electrons to tunnel uh, in a, a stronger way, so they tunnel less. The probability of tunneling under the barrier becomes less. It's that exponential term, the hyperbolic sign in the tunneling expression for energies below this barrier, right? It's an exponential decay under the barrier. But nevertheless, electrons can still tunnel, and it's here shown on this plot to five orders of magnitude. Now let's look above the barrier. I think that's actually the more interesting part. Uh, you have multiple peaks in transmission and dips in the reflection. Remember, in the two slides ago, I mentioned that the transmission over the barrier has a sine KL in it, which is kind of like a quasi-bound state above a barrier, right? Ground state, excited state. Two states that are visible in this energy range, right? And there's actually a third one you can sort of see on the top lurking with a third dip in the reflection coefficient, okay? And it's determined by the length of this barrier and the propagating energy or the propagating momentum k above that barrier. Okay? Again, that is something we don't think about barriers normally. Where we say, well, yeah, we can tunnel, and that's all you ever hear in your class. Okay? All right. So this is sort of a summary that an increased barrier width increases the oscillation frequency in the transmission and reflection, and there's quasi-bound uh, quasi states. And again, why is this uh, increasing? Why is the frequency increasing? Well, you make the resonator longer, that means you can pack more waves at a, at a smaller uh, energy distance into it. Okay? That's why these resonance energies get closer. Okay? 